Hello and good afternoon. My name is Zalima Chavez and I'm the Support Center Manager for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, or AFA. This episode is produced independently by AFA and made possible in part by support from Amgen, Sanofi, and Regeneron. Today, we're talking about nasal polyps with Dr. Kathleen Bukite, Associate Professor of Medicine and Associate Fellowship Training Program Director in the Division of Allergy and Clinical Immunology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Bukite, welcome and thank you for joining us on today's episode. Thank you so much for having me today. Today, we're going to talk about nasal polyps and the effect they can have on a person's quality of life. Sometimes this disease is referred to as chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, but for simplicity, we'll use the term nasal polyps for today's discussion. Dr. Bukite, what exactly are nasal polyps and what are the common symptoms associated with this condition? Yeah, so nasal polyps are growths that um, come from your uh, sinuses and can extend into the nasal cavity. And the most common symptoms that they cause are um, nasal congestion or blockage, feeling like air can't move in and out through your nose. Um, and they can also cause impairment in sense of smell. So decrease in sense of smell or um, in really severe cases, complete loss of sense of smell. And then a lot of patients also have a lot of um, nasal discharge related to it. So that can look like a runny nose, sometimes thick nasal discharge, and sometimes post-nasal drip. You mentioned nasal congestion, and this is the most common symptom of nasal polyps reported by AFA's community. But the symptom that is most talked about is the loss of smell. And many people may not realize how much losing smell can affect your quality of life and safety. Yeah, this is a really good point. So I think for folks who have a normal sense of smell, it's one of those things you can take for granted a little bit. Um, but in our patients who've lost their sense of smell, they tell us about how it has really profound impacts on their overall well-being um, and you know their day-to-day -day life and quality of life. So people notice things like they can't smell something burning in their home, which could be certainly a big safety concern. They might not know that what they're cooking is burning and that could lead to fire or other danger. Um, you know, people who have little kids or babies might not notice if their baby needs a diaper change. So again, that's really important in terms of the health of your children. And uh, those, are, those are symptoms that our patients experience. You know, other really important things that people notice is that they're maybe not as able to enjoy food as much um, as they had when they had an intact sense of smell. So, you know, in addition to the important safety considerations, there's also really important considerations just for overall enjoyment of life. Thank you for sharing that. It's so important to have your sense of smell and, and you bring up some great examples of when you don't have and you experience that loss of the sense of smell, how we could impact your day to day. And even, you know, you may find yourself in, in a situation that may be dangerous. People with asthma and allergies have a greater chance of developing nasal polyps. How are these conditions connected? Yeah, that's another really good question. So um, we've actually really learned a lot about this over the past few years, doing a lot of really uh, cool um, clinical studies as well as basic science lab research. We're learning a lot more about what causes nasal polyps. And what we've learned is that there's really a, a shared inflammatory pathway um, in what drives the development of nasal polyps and also what um, drives diseases such as allergies and asthma. Um, we know that the immediate cells that can line your nasal passages, which are called epithelial cells, they're kind of, they make up that structural lining, can get very dysregulated, meaning they can be really abnormal in both uh, nasal polyps and asthma. And they can produce um, proteins that lead to inflammation um, really downstream, leading to this really, um, you know, obviously unpleasant experience. And you certainly in some cases um, can, you know, cause a lot of sickness and a lot of problems for people with both nasal polyps and asthma. So there's really um, a shared pathology and shared abnormality in what we're seeing in the linings of the sinuses and also the lower airways in the lungs that people with both nasal polyps and asthma have. 
Afa recognizes that there is a need to better understand the challenges and barriers to get a timely diagnosis, quality medical care, effective treatments, and access to resources for nasal polyps. If someone suspects that they may have nasal polyps, what steps should they take and what can they expect in the diagnosis process? Yeah, that's that's a great point. So we do hear from a lot of patients and see, you know, in my own personal practice, patients who've had symptoms for a really long time before they can access the help they need and get the right diagnosis, and then subsequently the right treatment for their problem. So um, if a patient were to suspect that they had nasal polyps, right, they have new or worsening nasal congestion, they're noticing that their sense of smell is not as strong as it had been in the past, um, you know, obviously be important to bring these symptoms up to their primary care doctor, or even, you know, if they're very concerned and, and can do so, seek specialist care. The type of doctors that can care for patients with nasal polyps um, frequently are otolaryngologists or ear, nose, and throat doctors, um, ENT doctors for short, um, to really formally make the diagnosis of nasal polyps. Um, those doctors will actually do something called nasal endoscopy, where they'll look into the nasal cavity to, to try to visualize nasal polyps. And sometimes when they can't see them, they'll even do um, a picture of the sinuses um, called a CT scan. Um, other doctors that can help um, treat and kind of work up causes of nasal congestion include allergists. So they'll often, you know, they'll treat a lot of um, what we call the comorbidities, uh, other conditions that patients with nasal polyps have, such as allergies or asthma, but also often can look into uh, patients' nose and, and visualize the nasal polyps. So I think for folks who are concerned that they might have this problem, really uh, the first step in addressing it would be obviously bringing it up to um, your primary care doctor, um, but often it leads to a referral for more specialty care with either an otolaryngologist or an allergist. And I'll also take a moment to highlight the Life with Nasal Polyps report. It was recently published by AFA and uses insights from a patient caregiver survey to identify and provide opportunities for improving nasal polyp care in the United States. If you're interested in learning more, we've included the link for you in the description box below. And again, as Dr. Bukite said, your healthcare provider will be the greatest resource that you have in seeing if you do have nasal polyps or maybe it's a different condition like allergies. It sounds like there could be overlap with the different symptoms and it may seem like you may think you have allergies, but there is a possibility that it could be something like nasal polyps. So we encourage you to reach out to your doctor and get that discussion started. So we've talked about symptoms to look out for, as well as what the diagnosis process looks like. And I want to pivot now to treatments. And there are several treatments currently available to help manage nasal polyps. Can you discuss those different options? Uh, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, the first line treatment that is generally recommended to patients with nasal polyps are intranasal steroids. Um, which is an anti-inflammatory medicine that can actually be directly applied to the polyp tissue um, and the sinuses. And there's multiple ways that we recommend patients do that. Sometimes um, it will be in the form of a nasal spray. Sometimes it'll be in the form of an irrigation, meaning like a saline wash, where we um, have patients put the intranasal steroid into the wash. So that is often um, one of the first line treatments that we give patients. Occasionally we'll recommend a course of oral steroids, but we don't like to use that a lot because um, oral steroids like medicines like prednisone can have some bad long-term side effects. So while they work really well, as long as you're taking them, it's not really something that we can have patients use long-term. Um, when we have patients who do all the right things and use intranasal steroids and the saline irrigations or nasal washes without adequate control of symptoms, we recommend really um, stepping up to additional therapy, which can include treatments like endoscopic sinus surgery, where um, by patients have surgery to remove some of the uh, or much of the nasal polyp tissue and also open up their sinuses so that the intranasal steroids can reach really far into the sinuses at the places where the polyps originate. Um, and then a newer treatment option that's really been um, more widely used over the past five or six years is something called biologic therapy, which is a medicine that we've been using, a type of medicine, a class of medicines that we've been using for a while for treatment of asthma um, that 
also work very well for patients with nasal polyps. And these are injections that patients can give themselves either at home or sometimes get in our you know, hospital or in our clinic office. And these injections can really be quite helpful in managing symptoms of nasal polyps as well. You mentioned biologic therapy or surgery for nasal polyps. And what are some things that people should consider if they're deciding between the two? Um, so, you know, this is a really individualized, personalized question. So um, in conversations with your doctor, um, there are a variety of risk factors that we can look at for each patient that might tell us which therapy um, might be preferred and, and really offer a good risk benefit discussion about either surgery versus um, biologic therapy. Um, for example, when I see a patient who also has really severe asthma, sometimes we'll recommend something like biologic therapy instead of surgery because it will help with two really severe problems, both nasal polyps and asthma. But for many patients, especially folks who've never had um, sinus surgery in the past, it, it can be a great option um, in terms of you know quickly helping to resolve symptoms that are impairing quality of life and you know allowing the patients to breathe in and out through their nose um so you know we have a lot of patients that that choose to go on to have sinus surgery especially folks who've never previously had surgery um when we see patients who've had really you know excellent well done surgeries in the past and um taken their intranasal steroids after surgery and then have recurrence of nasal polyps after surgery at that point we'll often recommend a biologic for those patients and you've mentioned nasal sprays. Sometimes people in our community tell us that they've used an over-the-counter corticosteroid nasal spray for their nasal polyps for a while, and then it stops working for them. What should people look out for, and when should they follow up with their doctor? Yeah, that's a great point. So we see that in our in our practice with the patients that come in. Um, oftentimes, um, someone can have an initial good response to intranasal corticosteroid, whether it be a spray or irrigation. And we'll you know, notice that they can breathe in and out through their nose better, that they have reduction in some of that really like thick um, mucus that is bothering them or causing really bad post-nasal drip and cough, or even improvement in their sense of smell with the intranasal steroid. Um, and you know, it can wear off over time. Um, that can you know, potentially be for a variety of reasons, but if the polyps are growing, it might be blocking the nasal cavity such that then the intranasal steroid can't get very far up, right? You can't reach the places where that inflammation's really started. So, you know, if this happens to you, if you notice that, hey, you had a, you know, reasonably good effect and you had a conversation with your doctor that was like, oh, I'm doing great. I'm going to continue on the steroid. And then over time, the symptoms really progress and are impairing quality of life. It, that's really when it's time to go back in to see your doctor, to talk to them about whether or not, you know, another treatment modality would be indicated, something like surgery or biologics, or even if there's a, you know, reason to do something like an oral steroid, like prednisone in that case. Um, you know, I always tell my patients, we don't want you to suffer and not tell us. If you're if you're feeling bad, please come back in. You're never bothering me. Yeah. We always want to know about it. Because I think I think people think, oh, you know, I told them I was doing so well and, and now I'm not, I'm, you know, not wanting to bother them or go back in. But but that's what we're here for. That's what we love to do. So um that would be the the time to go back into your doctor and say, you know, initially it helped, but now I really feel like it's not enough anymore. And there's a lot more we can do to to get people feeling better. Yeah, these conversations are really important and patients sharing how a medicine or a treatment is working for them. Are they seeing improvements? Are they seeing that the symptoms are getting worse? This is really valuable information to share in those conversations with a healthcare provider. And if someone chooses to move forward with the surgery to remove the nasal polyps, what are some steps they can take to stop them from coming back? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So, um you know, I would recommend first and foremost discussing um, plans for ongoing management after surgery with your healthcare provider. Um, things that we most commonly use for patients who've had surgery are intranasal steroids, which again can be delivered uh, with a variety of different modalities. Sometimes at the beginning, right after surgery, um, 
you know, the otolaryngologist will recommend patients uh, use regular irrigations with steroids in it to get that medicine really far up into the sinuses where all that inflammation can start. But after time, if someone does really well after surgery, they often get de-escalated, meaning the therapy um, can be changed from an irrigation, which can be a lot of work to do, to something like a nasal spray, which is a little bit easier to do. Um, and then, you know, it's really important to follow your healthcare provider's instructions about um, when should I come in for follow-up? Because oftentimes patients will have um, nasal endoscopy done after surgery to really monitor for inflammation because it's helpful to know early on, um, are polyps starting to grow back? Does it look like there's a lot of inflammation in the sinuses? Um, because treating more aggressively upfront can really help to prevent nasal polyps from recurring. And some some folks need more aggressive treatments than others. Clear, you also mentioned biologics as a treatment option, and many people continue to have trouble accessing biologic treatments for nasal polyps or asthma. These treatments, um, you don't just pick them up at your local pharmacy. And if someone is prescribed a biologic, what can they expect for the next steps? Yes, this is a, a really good point. Um, so. Biologic medications are most frequently administered either at doctor's office or infusion center type place, or you can sometimes get them at home. But when patients get them at home, they're actually not from a, a typical pharmacy. They come usually in the mail through a, re, a specialty pharmacy. Um, so after your doctor prescribes it or healthcare provider prescribes it, um, generally it goes through a uh, prior authorization process, which can take a little bit of time. Um, and then after that, once you hear that it's been approved, um, it needs to actually be mailed from the pharmacy, which can involve some steps in coordination. So what I tell my patients is, you know, this may not be something that you start in, you know, tomorrow or this week, it might take a little bit of time. So it's important to kind of be patient and, um, you know, have a good understanding of sort of when you should follow up if you haven't heard anything, um, when when you should check in with your provider's office to know, you know, is there anything from your end that they need in terms of information. Um, but then once approved, you'll get some often phone calls or messages where you have to coordinate with the specialty pharmacy that's going to send the medicine to your house. They want to, you know, make sure that you're going to be home to receive it. And so, you know, not ignoring those phone calls is important. So I always tell my patients that as well. It's a, it's a little bit of coordination to set it up at the beginning. And then once it gets going, it's often, um, you know, pretty routine, you know, every month or, you know, whenever the prescriptions do to be refilled, patients will be contacted by the specialty pharmacy and then it'll often be sent out to them. Um, for patients getting it in clinic, it can be, again, a similar little amount of back and forth, um, waiting for the approval to happen. And then once the approval happens, scheduling the appointment to go in and get the injections. So again, um, it can take a little, little bit of time to set up a little bit more than a normal medication. That's really helpful to know. And for more information about managing nasal polyps, we've also included a resource, a guide to nasal polyps in the description box below, and we encourage you to check it out. And if you have any other questions, this is a great time to reach out to your healthcare provider and talk about symptoms you're having, the different treatment options and what it'll look like for you, as well as what's the best treatment option available for you. Dr. Bukait, thank you so much for joining us today to discuss living with and managing nasal polyps. We hope that this brings awareness to a disease that is not well known by the general public. Thank you so much for having me. We hope our listeners have enjoyed our Afternoon Chats podcast available on Spotify and YouTube. Don't miss our future episodes. Remember to like and subscribe to our channels. The information presented in our podcast is educational and not intended to provide individual medical advice. Please talk with your healthcare provider for advice about your personal health. If you have questions or want to talk to someone about asthma, allergies, nasal polyps, or other allergic conditions, our Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America online community is always open. You can find it at aafa.org slash join. Before we say goodbye, we'd like to thank Amgen, Sanofi, and Regeneron again for their kind support for this episode. Have a good afternoon, everyone.